Hello everyone, this is Low Code Campfire, uh, episode number 40 for um, March 4th, 2022. And I am broadcasting today from a uh, remote, undisclosed location. I'm, actually, it is a disclosed location. I'm visiting my parents. And uh, so today we're going to get into some fun things, opportunities to encourage plant and app newbies. And uh, so that'll be um, a fun topic, plus whatever you guys have brought. So here we go. Um, this is a weekly event that we do for the community that is all skill levels welcome. And really, it's about fostering community. And uh, I've said many times how, how encouraged I am that, that you guys help each other as much as you do. But we get together and share techniques, challenges, experiences. We always encourage you to bring something to show. All these are recorded, at least the first half, and those show up on our YouTube channel, plantandapp.youtube.com uh, slash plantandapp. So we encourage you to subscribe to that. We have a, uh, a pretty open agenda. We do first call whatever's going on, uh, whatever, um, whatever you need to talk about first. And then we do things like look at uh, contributions to our communal website, uh, talk about feature requests, any sub topics that got submitted in advance, open mic, sometimes I sing. The main thing is that uh, we, we have, uh, well, not main thing, but we do, as a courteous group, we ask you to mute if you've got activity going on behind you that might be distracting. You can submit questions and topics in advance, and you can use that link or the link that's in the email. And with that, I will say hello. Good day, wow. sir. Thank you. Hello. Dale, Ben, Jerry. Hello, everybody. Good morning, everyone. Your second. Ben and Jerry are here. Ben and Jerry. And that's we. Yeah, we're, we're starting a new company. It's ice cream and programming. Fair it, it's expensive ice cream, though. I'm, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, rain food. What? Go ahead. My fun thing this morning was uh, uh, in rural Massachusetts, trying to find a, 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 the right way to connect to the internet was more of a challenge than you think it would be. My parents are in the process of getting fiber, but they have uh, DSL right now, so it's not really as good as I'd hoped, but apparently you can hear me, so that's a good deal. Yeah, it's good. Good deal. All right, I, so we... I got a quick question. Yes. Um, you mentioned at the beginning of each of the campfires that there is a link in the email to submit uh, questions or topics. Which yes, email? Because I get an email from Zoom, but there, I don't see any link in there at all. Well, so actually, so do you get the Wednesday, the, the, every Wednesday about midday, there's an email that goes out that uh, says what we're gonna be doing at the next campfire. Do you get that one? The I believe I do, and that would be I, the one. I have too, many, <laughs> too many emails. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't sure which email it was that it was in, so I want to make sure I'm looking at the right one. Well, but that is a good point. I will uh, certainly add that um, link into the same uh, into the Zoom email as well. We got, but the invitation that goes out typically Wednesday midday. That's the one that I was talking. About. Cool, thanks for bringing that up. So first call, what's on your mind? What's going on? Anybody with a problem? Question. One, one thing that it would be nice to talk about at some stage, in uh, maybe not today, is what Bogdan mentioned um, uh, on Wednesday about moving to Docker and .NET Core, and what that's going to mean in practice, how we're how we're all going to do it, and what it means for us. Well, absolutely, I I put on my list here just recently to learn more about Docker, and uh, I I need to understand the same thing. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, Don, if you want to kind of uh, go on about that, that would be great. Sure, sure. Actually, <clears throat> we planned uh, webinars about it, so there will be a local cafe just on this topic uh, before before 
the release is out, the next release. So uh, we'll have plenty of time to cover it in detail. The, I, I think the short version, I mean, from our perspective is that this is where we're going internally to start with, right? It's, it, it will not have impact on the, on the product immediately. So maybe maybe what's worth uh, mentioning is why we need to do this, right? Uh, basically, I mean, you know, DNN has been stuck from moving to .NET Core for a long time, and uh, Docker offers us the ability to start moving to .NET Core without moving DNN to .NET Core. So we start moving one feature at a time. So that's uh, that's why we we really need it. Plus, it creates uh, a much more modern and robust deployment mechanism. Docker outside DNN in the in the modern world, Docker has been the standard for deploying application for the past five years. <laughs> yeah. So is the is the idea that you'll have a multi-tier container with your database inside it, and I'll just uh, or is it or do I hook it up to an external database container and just blow the um, the the front end container away? Am I looking at um, hosting the containers on Windows. So, you know, I'm sure you'll cover all of that, but that's right. what's spinning around at the yeah. back of my head because the only experience I've got of running running things on Docker has all been on um, on Linux hosts mm -hmm. and yeah. you know, even SQL Server on Linux hosts. My, my attempts at using it on Windows have not been terribly satisfactory. Yeah, yeah. I think it progressed a lot. Like two years ago, it still would have been difficult to run it on Windows. But today it runs flawlessly on, on Windows. Okay, fair enough, that's good. Yeah. And in, in, in terms of the setup, the database still is the database, so it can live anywhere. Uh, we don't deploy it in the container, so it can be a separate database server or a separate container uh, as it is today. Uh, only the application, the DNN application will live in one container and the second container will contain the new .NET Core application. Okay. But you know, when you run Docker, they run transparently. You don't know that you have actually two applications. <laughs> if you, if yeah. you were in IIS, you'd have to manually create two applications. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's very, that's very helpful. Thanks. So changes, changes coming, and we will, we'll, we'll release information as we get there. But uh, mm -hmm. yep, thanks for being excited about that. Any other first call? I, I've got a good one. Uh, we don't have to spend this call as doing a tech support call, but uh, over the um, uh, th this past week, I had presented a challenge on the image editor. Some of you I know saw that, particularly uh, Ben and Mark had given me some good advice on that. The image editor action, if it could get a little love, would be so beneficial to making that product so much better. Uh, you know, one of the things that I'm tasked to do, Dale, is to uh, load a photograph, draw a box, and save that box which seems overly simplified and would seem like maybe it's already been done. Almost. Um, resizing in the process is where we're running into a challenge. And it would be so sweet if, if we pull in an image that's 4,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels and our crop box window is set to 300 pixels by 300 pixels, the ratio between the crop box and the picture is so far apart that the crop box is this little teeny tiny dot on a screen. And, um, and if you set the crop box to not be resizable because you demand it to be a 300 by 300, the image will only, if, even if you move that box, you're only gonna get small pixels or a small portion of that huge picture that you pulled in. What would be ideal would be if the crop box dimensions were ratioed to the image that just got brought in the crop. And then on the save, it saved the image at, in my example, the 300 by 300 pixels. I don't know what kind of love that would take, but I will pay for it if somebody would do it. It's something that is just being repetitively over and over again for me. Uh, it, it basically, we use it where our users, by the thousands, 
need to upload a picture and we must get control of the size of the picture for proper formatting and equally important um you know these crazy people are loading pictures from their phone that's three and four megabytes in size and the ratios are just all over the place and so that one little tool would just be an amazing enhancement to our already amazing arsenal so i'll just leave it at that the the question that i had would be in the meantime has any of us ever worked with that problem before and resolved it? I know Mark and Ben have spoke up uh, very loudly about that project. I was wondering, is there a way that we could, the image editor returns a base 64, could we then call an API somewhere, you know, somebody's service and pass that base 64 with, um, I'm just visualizing that the user had already cropped it out and we demanded it be 300 by 300, could we call an API, pass the base 64, get back a base 64 that's already cropped and then do the save file mechanism and, and go off and save it? I, I'm just looking for any advice on that. Again, don't make this call all day tech support on that, but uh, any help is greatly appreciated. Thank you. So I'm just going to start by saying I don't have experience in the area. I understand what you're trying to get done, but I don't. I don't have any great solutions. I think some some uh, questions have come up on that on the past, and I've pointed to there are some API services that do kind of uh, what what you're talking about for a fee, whatever. And I've posted links to that, but I, I haven't. It's not like I've solved it or have the answer. So Jerry, I, I was using this control on a website where folks were taking pictures of a, an automobile a classic car and they would walk around the car take a number of pictures and um and i had it set it, it was actually working well and it still does work well and i'm maybe i should just show it to you and see how that works for you but uh i got it working and um i think it's overcoming maybe the limitations you're talking about that's one thing. Maybe we should just work together on that. Uh, secondly, there's a image processor that's built into um, the the uh, Easy DNN News module that uh, does a bunch of automatic cropping and saving at different crop sizes and optimization. Um, if you've got that module already installed, then you've already got that ability. You just need to know how to use it. Maybe you already do. But you can also install that uh, photo cropping, resizing yourself without the module. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark. Uh, we'll take that up in private on a, on a different call. Um, I'll reach out to you personally afterwards, and uh, maybe someday in the next few days you could show me your work. That'd be greatly appreciated. Yeah, I hope it works out for you. Thank you. I said that I had no exposure to it. That's probably not exactly fair. I have it had a client website that had, um, they, they were many, many teams, hundreds of teams uploading many photos every month. And uh, so making sure that there were, there were thumbnails available. So resizing them down and getting them into standard sizes. Uh, we, I, I have had a little bit of, uh, I wrote some custom code to, to get that to happen. And I, my recollection is that the, um, the, .NET provided functionality to do that is not that hard. Because if it was hard, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So trying to turn that into something that's front end easy is, is another issue. Good to know. Well, uh, one of the things that um, I did find in uh, PAA, there is a thumbnail creator add-on in your updates that you can play with. Uh, its purpose in life is to take the image that you just uploaded and create a thumbnail from it. So you're still really uploading the big image along with the thumbnail, but it would, it, it has some nice automation crop tools and the ability to do that. Didn't quite serve my, my purpose. My goal was to basically uh, um, design a mechanism where a user or an administrator could upload a photograph. And if the photograph is a monster photograph, they could draw a predefined box, in my case, 300 by 300, and then capture that square. And then when it saves that square, that square would be 300 by 300. And uh, the only challenge 
that I think we're really having with the stock image editor is that when you load a four or 5,000 pixel image wide in depth, uh, it's drawing the box at a ratio in such a manner that it's just not the same. I would prefer it just to bring the 4,000 pixel image in and some reduced capacity where it's reasonable to see on the screen and then have the box ratioed to that. So wherever this square box, crop box moved onto that picture, that would grab that section at 300 or 300. That's the difference. It would take just a little bit of ratio uh, mathematics to just kind of figure that one thing out and then we'd be home free. But again, uh, I'm sure we've got way more important things to talk about than that, but that would be great. So Mark, I'll reach out to you. I, I know Ben had, had tons of experience with this and was uh, kind of hit a brick wall as well as I did. So I was hoping we might be able to gang up on the company and make something happen, but uh, you know the drill. I appreciate it, appreciate everything you do. So just let me know. Hey Mark, if you show Jerry that stuff, uh, can you loop me in on that too? Because I'd be really interested. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know, Ben. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we have standards. Darn, yeah. man, burn. <laughs> Mark, there will be ice cream involved for you. All right, so. it's down to better all the time. <laughs> I don't know how fast you can have it. That we might that might be a afterglow topic if you want to put that off later. I don't know. I don't want to put pressure. Okay. Um, other things for first call. Yeah, I, I have a question. <clears throat> so I've got a um, uh, a form that sits in uh, the same tab as a a grid, a list. And the form lives essentially to provide selection capability to filter the list. So all that's working fine. Um, the problem I'd like to eliminate, if this is possible, is the requirement to, to hit the submit button. Now, the, the form itself is a dynamic, the, the list of categories or groups is dynamically generated. So I can't do anything static with it. Otherwise, this wouldn't be a problem. So is there a way, does anybody know of a way to have essentially probably JavaScript um, that gets put in each item uh, so that when someone clicks it without hitting the submit button, it refreshes the grid? Absolutely. I do it all the time. Get out of town. <laughs> on, as long, well, you could do it on selection controls, you know, drop downs, things like that. You I wouldn't suggest doing it on a text box because no. as you're typing, you don't want every single character to cause a refresh. Right. But on drop downs, I do it all the time. As a matter of fact, prime example, you want a, a, an example, look at the feature request page. When you drop down on any of those filterable categories, yep. the list will immediately change. You don't have to click anything. Oh, Ben, you're a good man. <laughs> so um... I'll send you the information on that. Awesome. Why am I getting horrible deja vu on this, Dale? Did we not just study this topic recently? We did. Uh, Radu, and let's see if I can even find it here. Uh, in the, Radu's most, uh, one of the low-code cafes. Let me see. Sorry. I, I'm doing one screen today, too, so I'm a little bit hobbled. Let's see. Uh, um, plant an app in the... Uh, but it wasn't the most recent one he did, the one before that. Let's see if we can find it. Low code cafe. I think it's this one. Uh, 79. I think he went through, uh, whoop. Oh, check. the whole thing was about building just such a form and um, JavaScript front end, uh, building a filter form, syncing it with the URL. Uh, if, if you were to spend the 30 minutes on this one, you'd get a whole uh, introduction to the topic. And then, you know, Ben, what Ben has. Uh, Jerry, uh, excuse me, I think Mark also has uh, one that he's used quite frequently, which is um, automatically pushing a button when a field changes. So the on change click can be used to push a hidden button 
And so now yeah. the actions of a hidden button uh, can do, so you don't have to get heavy duty to JavaScript. The only JavaScript you need is to push the button. Right. And then with the objection that was mentioned about text, there's actually a technique to say, uh, which I, I know I've demonstrated before, but uh, to say that you, um, you watch the text box and you see that it has changed and you wait until it has stopped change for at least three seconds or a, a, a programmable time. So um, then, and then it pushes the button. So there's, there's a solution to all of it that isn't terribly complex. Matthew, I think, I think one of the things that, well, sorry, Ben, I may have stepped on. I think one of the things Ben's going to show you and this article will show you is how to achieve what you're trying to do without doing a post back to the form. Uh, you know, you don't have to refresh the whole page or do a post back to the page. The, uh, there are some incredible JavaScript lessons in here. Ben, I'll hush. Tell him the real truth now. <laughs> I was just going to say, honestly, uh, Matt, you'd be surprised. It's literally one line of code. Um, all you have to do is in your dropdown under bind expressions on yep. change click, you're yep. just going to add the DNNSF dot update query string param, yep. paren, and then you're just going to pass it two parameters, the query string item and its value. Pass that. And as long as your grid is set to update itself based off of the query string, so it's watching it, that's yeah. all you need. The second you do that, your grid's going to update. Cool. It's literally one line of code. I think I can handle one line of code. <laughs> I really do. Thank you. So ben, the, the solution I used, used a submit button and I'm using that one line of code to push the submit button. Did, have you done any testing? Is the, is the query string a faster way or anything like that? Well, I did it this way basically to avoid having the person basically having to do two things instead of selecting the drop down. So click the drop down, select an item, click submit. They just click the drop down, select the item. Right. My, Get rid of my, the submit. my implementation has the hidden submit button. And I, they click the drop down. It 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 runs a piece of that of a the API to go find you know to push the submit button for them basically automatically. Oh um, well, I mean that's it's a it's functional. Um, you know, there's always a good case to uh, saying if it works, leave it be. But it's more complicated to do it that way. You'd have to have obviously the button plus the code within the button plus code to find the button plus code to click the button when all you need is one line on the actual dropdown list itself and just say when you change an item on the dropdown list, update the query string. The grid is automatically watching the query string. It does the rest. You don't have to do anything else. Right, but putting stuff in a button though does have advantages too because now you've got the full action stack so if you can you do need, a lot more than just refreshing right if you need yes it. if you need to do something other than just pass a query string parameter to get the the grid to update its values then yes doing the button would really be necessary because you need ac access to those action lists but if all you're trying to do is pass something to the query string to get the grid to refresh this is the simplest method to implement. It definitely is. But there's yeah. a case, business case for both, I think. Yeah. Yes. And in my I case, concur. in my case, literally all I'm trying to do is get the grid to refresh. So this would do the trick. So it's the update query string param key value in the on change click. Sounds if about you, right. Yeah. If you're, if what you're trying to do is update the query string to force it, Otherwise, there is an API to just refresh the grid by itself. Right. But typically, if you're doing a dropdown, you want to pass that to the query string so that there's new information for the grid to refresh based off of. Yeah, so, yes. and that's precisely what I want to do. Yes. Yep. So you got it. Thank you. Appreciate it. So circling back, what I would do, uh, I mean, it just sounds like you've got the right thing. Uh, again, Radu. Uh, built that in 44 minutes. So what I would do would be to go on YouTube, put it to uh, show it at 50% speed <laughs> and, and play that back. Cause, cause he, cause he, Roddy. he was talking, it was Radu. He was, he was, he was blowing. But, uh, 
Well, actually, there's two factors. One, Rado talk, talks fast, and two, I'm slow on the uptake. <laughs> so 25% might be better. <laughs> you know, that, Dale, this brings up a uh, feature request idea for me because I've actually thought about this. I, I program and hide buttons so many times that I was wondering if there was some way we could add an action stack to other controls besides buttons. Like if it were added to a dropdown, maybe it could be automatically uh, called with Ajax so it didn't uh, refresh the page. But I would love to have an action stack on more things than just buttons. That's I also like the same. I felt the same thing before as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's an idea, on change call workflow. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could do that, can't we, already? On change, we can call workflow. By using uh, my token the token. as the intermediary. Yeah, that's true. So workflow as a token yeah. and call the token. It's a little bit roundabout if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we could add the action stack right to a control one of the other fields or several of them probably. I don't know how, that sounds difficult to me, not being the one who's building the program, but uh, yeah, it's, it's come up in my mind before. It'd be really useful. Cool. All right. So we're, we're connecting the right people with the right things to down. What else? Yeah, I have a, a little question, um, sure. if you don't mind. I have a, a page with a, a good number of forms open on it. Um, I am trying to control their opening and closing so that I don't have a really crowded screen. And I really only need uh, one on the screen all the time and then others to come up as needed. Um, I'm trying to control the presentation of how they open and how they close. And I have found that once a form is open, I can do a, a, a jQuery hide and, and a jQuery show. And the advantage of that is I can, I can make it like when it, when it opens, it can scroll open very nicely, like starting at the top and then making its way down. And then when you close it, it can, it goes up and then it, it kind of collapses in place, which is very nice. It presents well. It also removes the blink that happens when you're opening a form using the init method. You know, the, the, the new form comes in and it goes big old blink. And I would prefer to avoid that if I can. And, and this way does it. But the problem is um, the initial form open on the second or lower form um, always has the blink because it's, it's an init call. And it's one of those D and SF commands uh, that are provided for us. It doesn't seem to have any possibility of doing the, uh, the slide open and slide shut. So um, that's what I would like. So if anyone has a way to open or init a form, that's not already open, but I but init it and have it slide open instead of blink in. That's my question. Judging by the silence. Is is there an event? Is there an event raised when the when the, when sorry, is the is there an event raised when the when a form has finished initing? Is there so? Because I, what I was thinking is obviously you the, the jQuery um, show and hide the things the thing exists you know it's already there you're just showing whether you, you're just you're just revealing it on the page so if you could if you could load the load or in it the form in its usual way hidden and then the the effect the event says I've I've finished initing jQuery can now slide me open. But you'd need something that would 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 um, al would notify the uh, uh, notify that the init had finished and the form was uh, uh, the form was ready. Well, I could certainly put something in the events to do that very thing. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll play with that. That's good. I'll put an event in the init. Um, and see if I can control how it slides open or close. Uh, I, you know, I'm using the, the DNNSF, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have that memorized, um, to, op to initially initialize that form. Um, I didn't know that I could control its presentation while it's opening. 
that way. So I'll give that a try. I appreciate the uh, oh, yeah. suggestion. Yeah. I think I think what you have to do, have to do is init it in a close in it. You, you use your jQuery to have a closed div and you init it inside a closed div. Uh, you know, notify that it's finished initing and then slide open with jQuery. I you got see, you. Have a, you have an event listener in jQuery that says, uh, "Wait, wait for this, wait for this event, and then open." Yeah, I got you. I like that. Or, or something like yeah, yeah. That's a good suggestion. See that that's why this this forum helps so much. Green Thank trends. you, Jen. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move on to the least the one that we teased from the uh, from the email we sent out on Wednesday. Um, we are working with a, a training organization to bring in new um, people into Plant an App. Um, the The organization is called Launch Code. We've worked with them once before. I'm pretty sure. Bogdan, correct me if I'm wrong. That it's a Romanian. Uh, no, launch code is uh, US-based. US-based, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is the, is the um, target of our, is the people that we're bringing on board, do we, do we know where they're going to be? Uh, are they internationally based or? No, they'll be mostly US, I think. But correct, logged in probably maybe um, um, uh, around St. Louis, I, I'm thinking. Um, yeah. St. Louis and I think Philadelphia, they opened the last mm -hmm. So uh, with that, um, I mean, this is an initiative that we're taking to, to uh, help uh, train people. It, it ends up, I mean, it, it, it helps them. It helps us because we have more people involved in understanding our product and uh, it potentially could help you as you're trying to, if, if you were to, to uh, want to hire somebody that already understands the product. So that's the general direction that we're going. But the question is, um, whether, for example, one way that we're thinking we could potentially do this would be to uh, have the kickoff class, the orientation for this happen in, uh, in a campfire so that these people would not only get a sense of the product, but the, the people and connect up with the people that, uh, that are using it and perhaps ask some questions. But it would take over a campfire episode if we did it that way. And uh, the our plan is to have it go on for two months from whatever time we start. It might be a month from now or so, but, uh, and then potentially we could have a demo day. So giving these students a, an opportunity to work forward for uh, the, you know, here's a project that they're going to work for and, and be able to present it to someone. So potentially we could do a demo day and, and uh, that would consume another campfire if we did that. So just kind of checking. And then between that there, there's the opportunity uh, for anyone who wanted to help out to either mentor or hold office hours uh, for in individual uh, students to be able to come and ask questions. And, and uh, I mean, we're, we're going to be holding uh, internally, we will mentor and we will hold office hours, but there's opportunity for the community to do that if anyone wanted to get behind it. So yeah. there's some opportunities within Campfire, wanted to get your sense of whether or not that would be a good use of your time or whether that would be intrusion and and then just want to make you aware that these other opportunities are available for people who want to participate yeah and uh, daily if you want maybe you can open launch code website uh, on your screen and just to paint the full picture so launch code is a non-profit organization they are focused on on helping people get in it right so they are doing this uh, this training uh, free of charge to, to uh, teach people usually coding languages, right? So that's their main focus on, on coding, but they are open about low code because they hear more and more about it and companies demand low code developers nowadays. So I think it's, uh, it's an opportunity to, to both give back to these people to help them uh, reach a job, but also it's an opportunity for, for us uh, as a community to recruit people, to, to uh, expand in more companies, uh, where these people will get hired and so on. So there is a, a let's say, a bigger picture here. And Patrick, uh, you added something there? 
Yeah, so the, the first link is to the, the launch code homepage and the second link is just to a, um, a page within launch code. And I just wanted to point out that uh, one of the things we're, as we're working with launch code that uh, they're hoping um, might happen is they're hoping to pull people from the, uh, the Women Plus program um, in, uh, who have just gone through that program to uh, then go in possibly to the, to the, uh, the plant in that program, which is kind of exciting. So um, I just wanted to give you those two links. So you have a little bit more context of where we're going with this. So I guess additionally, I'll just um, add to what Dale already said is that, uh, you know, we're hoping that if um, any of you are willing to participate in at any level that you want, that um, it will help the participants of the program to see people who are not necessarily working for Plant and App, but are actually using it in the real world uh, to, to, you know, to see that, that experience and, to, and also to see what you have to offer as far as uh, um, your knowledge of, of, uh, of how the, the platform works. Anybody have any thoughts or comments? Uh, yeah, Patrick, uh, Dale, um, I'd be happy to help out. Cool. If we were to do the um, like the orientation or the demo day or both uh, here, would you be uh, would you consider that um, hijacking your time or? something that you'd be interested in seeing? That's a loaded question, isn't it? I personally think it'd be fine. I think it, it would be, it would be easier, easier to say yes if we had a, um, perhaps more defined expectations. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I would, we're very happy to help it depends on the timing um when it when you're going to do this but also that the the sorts of things you know you mentioned mentoring is that as people work through um work through problems they have someone to turn to is it mentoring people thinking about the world of work and you know what what working in low code might mean in different types of organization so i'm very happy to help but i'm not particularly clear on what sort of help is required. Sure, I mean, we, we still have a lot to, to define around this, but basically orientation, it will be one hour where we bring everyone and just give them, give them the perspective about what low code means, uh, what kind of stuff people build with it. I mean, you are building with it if, you, if we are doing it in the campfire. Just giving them a healthy perspective about how uh, the, the life of a low code developers look like and maybe more importantly for them during that one hour to understand the employee employment opportunities right their career paths so to speak in in terms of <clears throat> sorry in terms of mentoring i expect their help will be needed on the technical part you know so helping them uh, get unstuck uh, giving them maybe links to to see things links to videos uh, so I think maybe one hour a week or two hours a week, it will be uh, more than sufficient uh, to, to help uh, these people. The program lasts uh, for two months. So at the end of, uh, of the two months, uh, during the demo day, which again, maybe we cap to one hour or two hours, depending on, on how many people want to demo their applications. Because the demo day uh, probably will invite a lot of more people to see what these people manage to build in just two months. right? Uh, that will be their chance to 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 uh, get hired, let's say. So launch code will get some of their partners, the companies they work with in this meeting, and then uh, uh, we'll get some of our customers to join that are looking to hire people. And of course, you'll be here. Uh, and uh, of course, you'll have if you plan to hire people. If any of you plans to hire people? You'll already have hired by then, I'm sure, <laughs> from from the people you mentor. Yeah, an hour a week sounds great. I'd be delighted. The, uh, just a question, that hour a week, you're, because I'm a little confused. I saw that 
it was saying like during campfire on some of these. So if you're doing an hour a week, you're not talking about doing it during campfire. It will be a separate, like a third yeah. 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 Uh, webinar. Yeah. We're thinking of doing, we're, we're, we're going to have office hours. Um, so that's uh, one uh, way of potentially participating, but also uh, um, I, I don't think we've totally settled on where this will live, but we yet, but we'll definitely have a, a place where they can go and ask questions and, uh, and, and maybe if anybody's willing to occasionally jump in and, and they see a question, you know, they can uh, they participate that way as well. Bogdan, does that sound right to you? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely be interested in, in, you know, helping out. I do that a lot as it is. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I, I like campfire and, you know, what we discuss and sometimes it's a little bit more higher level. Um, I don't want to take away from that. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely um, not. Yeah, we don't have any intention of it being a, um, an every, every week mm -hmm. thing at all. <laughs> no. Just really the the kickoff and uh, potentially the uh, demo day. Is that correct? Is that what yeah, we're just doing? the beginning and the end of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so thanks for for that feedback. We'll uh, we're still formulating the plan with launch code, and uh, so we'll we'll try to work and be respectful of the time. This really is more about. Uh, this hour is more about you and um, than, than it is other things, and we want to make sure that we continue to provide uh, what it is that you're looking for. Um, random note, I think I mentioned this in uh, Low Code Cafe, but this thing that we bumped into uh, in Campfire one time where the grid search wasn't working well because of special characters with sync with URL, so that one is fixed, and the uh, the hot fix is out and this, this note, it, yeah, passed QA, but it's actually out there and on the list of, so that you can grab that. Um, another one that that uh, I didn't get a chance to respond back to, and I don't I didn't see who, uh, um, this one was was Jim asking, uh, Maverick Jim Anthony asking about a PowerShell that's from, from last week. And I, I guess, I think I, uh, Mr. Everett, I have shared this back with, with Mr. Anthony now, the, your email back, but um, can you remind what that, uh, what the question was and how, what, 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 what the point was? Yeah. Uh, um, I, well, I think this came about when we were talking about how best to handle large, uh, large API calls and get them into SQL. Um, so that the, the example I showed, is based on what we do to pull pull out large large volumes of um, student data and get it into a SQL Server database table that they, they, that we can then use within um, Plant and App. So it's an alt rather than rather than using a a Plant and App solution, this is a this is an, a, another another method to that just runs from a Windows um, scheduled task. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks for sharing that. Where am I here? I'm at a blank screen. What's next? Do you want, we could take a look at, there's some things that are uh, right now out on community that are, that are unanswered and that might be a good uh, opportunity to talk about more things. Field input masking. Grids and grids, that looks good. We have we've done that before, no answers on that yet. Matthew, I think this one was one you were talking about and you've got an answer too. Yeah, I, I did uh, get an answer, that's kind of, really was part one of my follow on question today. So I've got it working without refresh using a submit. Now my next step is I want to get rid of that submit. So I think I have an answer there. I don't know that there 
I'll dig into these, I guess, offline. Um, oh, Don, I don't want to put you on the spot. Is there anything coming up on the on the new release that you want to talk about? I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am. Yeah, but I think I think the big uh, the big uh, uh, thing for us is still the Bootstrap five transition now. That's progressing well, but of course it affects every single, uh, let's say, front end feature that we have. <coughs> so that is a big, uh, it's a big thing. It will need a major uh, uh, effort to make sure that it uh, it migrates uh, smoothly from Bootstrap three. So I'm really curious if if any of you already tried uh, Bootstrap five on on some pages and what's what's the feedback so far. Yeah, this is Mark. Um, yeah, I did. I, just this week, uh, maybe a day ago, I got um, I got a copy of the Bootstrap 5 theme, and I got it loaded up and um, put a couple forms on and changed their Bootstrap mode to 5. I, I did have some problem. Um, I, I was getting those warnings that you showed us here, um, and it was saying it was a mixed environment, and I had to, uh, I refreshed the entire site and that cleared that up. So mm -hmm. it was um, a little bit alarming. Like I, I did everything right. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, I got that worked out. And you know, I, I didn't do extensive testing. I, at first I wanted to see, cause it was important to me. I wanted to know that I could pop up a form and because without getting up to Bootstrap 5 uh, in a mixed environment, I couldn't accomplish that. Um, and so yes, that worked for me. So uh, uh, there will be more testing. I'm, I'm developing a site right now, and I went ahead and upgraded it to 1.19 so that I could mm -hmm. continue to test the Bootstrap 5 as I'm working. So I'll probably have more to tell you later. But first, it's working. Cool. <clears throat> In 1.19, there's a lot of features missing from Bootstrap 5 yet. Uh, in 1.20, we need to have a feature parity for everything. So the nature of that uh, conversion is page at a time, right? We would flip the, the modules on, the, on a page to uh, Bootstrap 5, I, I suppose, if the module exists in multiple pages you'd have to do all those pages in conjunction with each other but you flip the modules you flip the page um and then there's there's testing so this is this um i guess part of the reason why we're going to leave bootstrap three around for uh a while we're not immediately pulling it from the product so that if we if you bump into anything it's possible to go back I'm going to be learning a lot more about it because I think it's a topic that I committed to doing a low code cafe on in the weeks to come. So we'll learn something and then we'll present more on it. Show exactly what's what you're going to be involved with as we uh, as you convert your sites to that. So. Yeah. Bogdan, do you have any idea what how it would impact like we have a theme on our site that was based on bootstrap three a third party theme mm -hmm. you know do you think it will be starting to in, introduce bootstrap five forms and things in a page will co conflict with that and and break things or what what do you think we should be on the lookout for i guess is <clears throat> Yeah, so most likely uh, we had the same issue like if you'd use action form on a Bootstrap 5 skin or Bootstrap 4 skin. Most of the things will work, but uh, things like uh, drop downs or pop ups would, would have issue. And it will be the same problem uh, the other way around if you use uh, a skin that's Bootstrap 3 with, uh, with uh, the new uh, templates in our modules that are Bootstrap 5. Uh, a part of it will work, but a large part, uh, another part will start failing like. Uh, uh, probably the same things. So uh, when you plan this migra migration, I think it's best that you migrate the skin as well to a Bootstrap 5 template so you, you are not worried. Mm -hmm. that hey, was Bogdan, my thought. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Bogdan Jerry here. Uh, is Bootstrap 4 more akin to 
Bootstrap 5 or Bootstrap 3. I, it seems like a lot of the popular skins are all Bootstrap 4 at the moment. Yeah, Bootstrap 4 is much closer to Bootstrap 5. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. So, Thank you. So I, I even think that it might work uh, just out of the box with Bootstrap 4 skins, but uh, we still have to do some testing. It doesn't. Okay. Mark. Uh, <laughs> uh, you, you know, the, the uh, items we talked about, um, the pop-ups, um, that was not working with Bootstrap mm -hmm. 4 on the theme. Okay. And that, that's, you know, I, I worked hard to make sure I got a, a newer theme mm -hmm. so that I could get things working. Yeah. In terms of migrating, let's say, a skin from Bootstrap 4 to Bootstrap 5, it's much easier than migrating it from 3 to 4. In, in 4, they changed a lot of things compared to Bootstrap 3. That's why we never managed to go from three to four. Uh, it was a lot of, uh, they changed a lot of, of the structure, but Bootstrap 4 and 5 is much closer to, to migrate. So Ben is being uh, very polite and has raised his hand. <laughs> Sir, what can we do? Yeah, um, I just have a question. Um, this is not regarding bootstrap, um, so we could relegate this to, to later on, but I just want to throw this out there and have people think on it and see if anyone has a, any light to shed on this. The order in which forms and modules load, um, I know I, ha I, I had brought this up, I think, once before a long, long time ago, um, and I'm just curious if anyone else has found a way of mitigating or controlling the order in which things load because I'm having an issue for argument's sake. I have a website where in every single page I have a shared module that's on the top. It's the very first module on every page. It's basically an informational module that shows the current user what their filtering is currently set to and a whole bunch of other stuff. Underneath that I may have multiple grids, other forms, things that load based off of whatever page they're on. I'm finding that lots of times grids specifically will load in an instant underneath and the form that's above it takes many seconds to load. And sometimes someone doesn't even realize that that form didn't load and they start to interact with the grid and they go to click on a button and all of a sudden the form appears, pushes the grid down and then they click on the wrong button. Is there a way that anyone has, first off, has anyone else found this uh, to be an issue for them? And two, has anyone found a way around it to force modules to load in a certain order? I have the problem. Um, <laughs> and, but my, and my only solution has been to hide the, hide the grid, and at the last action of the last form loading, at, you know, show the grid to the, you know, show the grid so they, they can't interact with it. Before. I thought about that, but in my particular issue, like I said, that the one form that's important is shared across all pages and every page is different. So I can't hard code and say, show the grid because yeah. this form, this page has the grid, the other page doesn't. Yeah. So oh. it's... Ben, uh, I think last week I suggested this uh, window post message mechanism in JavaScript. And that doesn't, that, that the advantage of that solution is, is that modules don't need to, to know each other. So then the idea is that in the form, in the shared form, you raise a window message saying form loaded or whatever you want to call it. And then uh, in something inside the page, you can catch that message and then show the grid, for example. Right? And this was in low code. Uh, I think in the in the campfire uh, we are mentioning uh, one or two weeks ago how to how to uh, something yes, information from one form to another. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And I mentioned the oh, that might be the day I had to leave early, so okay. I have to go back and look. Yeah, I can I can uh, leave a link here so you see the EPA. So, so essentially, you're saying the 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 um, the common form would be raising an event saying "common form loaded," mm -hmm. 
anything could respond to, to that so that you would know if, if you on a particular page need to know that the common form has been loaded first, at least you can wait for that, that event and respond to it. That's what I'm getting out of what you said. Yep. So, so I'm sorry, just a quick question. So in that scenario, Bogdan, you're basically saying like you would have to have in a way two forms, another form that would be listening for that post message and then that form would do whatever custom action it needs to do for that page? Uh, I think so, although I think maybe you can do it directly in, 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 in Action Grid in the uh, initialized JavaScript section. I think you can do the wiring there. You don't need oh. an extra form. Perfect. All right, cool. Thanks. Or you, you can put it anywhere in anything on the page that can run a JavaScript on initializing. Is there is the is the problem? I mean, Jim, you said you had a similar problem, and I'm just I'm wondering: is it always that the grids are loading for, faster than the forms? In in my case, yes. That and it, it's almost identical to what Ben described: is people start interacting with the grid, and then and you know, then they, they then they work get the form up and they pick something, and the grid's refreshing three or four times before they actually get some more form. Yeah. Oh, one thing that maybe it's worth pointing out, an extra reason to adopt Bootstrap 5 earlier, both the listing and the form are much, much faster. The action form we actually switched to, uh, to Razor rendering, so now it's much, much faster. And the listing we switched to Angular, uh, pure Angular, uh, the new Angular, and it's so much faster. So uh, that's great I think here. I think that's an extra reason to adopt them earlier. And I'm, I'm even curious now <laughs> to hear from Ben uh, if he gets the chance to do some testing in the beta testing to hear if specific, specifically for this setup, if, if uh, there's any improvement. I will look into it. You know, I'm doing something that seems similar to what you're describing, Ben. You know, with what I just described with my question, got one form I always want on the page and then other forms are called as needed. Um, and if I let the first form load all, to, all together and the second form was uh, on the page but was set to open manually or in text, then the first form would load, the second form would be there but not loaded really. And then it if you wired up the event of the first form, so the last section then at the bottom after everything is loaded on the first form, it could init any additional forms or grids that were sitting there waiting to be init. Would that control the traffic? I, in what you're explaining, I would think that that would. However, that would be custom to that page. If it's a shared form, like in my case, that is across multiple pages, that wouldn't work because you'd have to have custom code for every single page that you possibly put this form on because every page is going to be designed differently with different modules. They're not all going to have the same module ID or you know module titles, whatever it is you're using to identify them and show them, you would have to code each possible scenario in that one form and do you know a lot of jumping through hoops to determine what page you're on, what modules am I supposed to load, so forth, so on. Um, yeah. I was just you know looking to see if there was a, an easier way or, or some more universal way um, to be able to control the order of the, the loading, mainly because like I said, in, in this particular uh, instance, this one site I'm working on, it's just a consistent thorn in my side because the page loads and grids are like popping up immediately and that darn filter form at the top is taking forever to show up. I always find that forms are much slower to load than uh, the grids are. Yeah. So Ben, another solution that I was just thinking, you could, you could implement, a, let's say, a jQuery script that looks at all the grids. So you put this jQuery script in the main form, in the shared form. And then it looks at all the grids on the page and shows all the grids on the page, you know, 
because with jQuery you can you can find the DOM elements of all uh, of all uh, 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 grids. You grab their ID, you know, and then you look through them and show them. You know, so then you could you could have only one script that's in the shared form, but then you have to remember on all pages to make the grids initially hidden. I was I was thinking something along the same lines. If you've got control over your skin, um, you could start off with all of your you your, you've got your filter form which you want to load first, and then you put everything else in another um, pane, and that pane is is hidden with CSS to begin with. And as as Bogdan says, you have you have a bit of uh, you have a bit of jQuery at the end of the of when the the filter form loads that just unhides the container which holds all of your all of your other. It's yeah, that's that's a very good idea, Jim. And actually, now you inspire me to have an even better solution. <laughs> So I think, Ben, what you could do that would be so much easier is, you know, in grid, you can put a root CSS class. So you put a root CSS class and you define that in your CSS file as hidden. Uh, and then when you load the form, you override that class. Or even better, maybe you uh, put a class on the body, for example, let's say init form loaded. And then from CSS, you make everything in it form loaded to be visible or something like that. So that sounds like a much easier solution inspired oh, by Jim of, here. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. That's a, that's a good workaround. Yeah. Okay, good brainstorm. We've hit our hour, so I'm gonna call it here. We'll stop the recording in just a second, but I wanna thank you all for showing up to uh, Loco Campfire for today. And um, we will see you next week. <laughs>